Good morning. For those of you who are our guests, my name is Todd Still. I serve as Dean of Truett Seminary, and it's my joy to welcome you to what is our regular chapel time, which uh, today is also the first of three lectures of the Leo and Gloriana Parchman Endowed Lectures. Established in 1999, made possible through the generosity of Leo and Gloriana Parchman, this endowment funds an annual lecture to support the mission and curriculum of the seminary by enabling world-renowned theologians, not unlike Reverend Professor Swinton, from a variety of fields and disciplines to give lectures on topics of current need or interest. The lectures focus on the concerns of both theory and practice related to issues in Christian ministry and encourage dynamic discussion on topics related to theological studies. The 2023-2024 Parchment Endowed Lectures series is presented this year by the Reverend Dr. John Swinton. He will be speaking on Seeking Sanctuary, Finding Shalom, a deeper, kinder, practical theology of mental health. Before introducing Reverend Professor Swinton, please allow me to thank our lectures committee, Dr. Kimlin J. Bender serves as chair. Other members include Dr. Andrew Artiberry, Dr. Brian Brewer, and Dr. Rebecca Poe Hayes. I would also like to thank Julie Covington for administrative support to the lectures committee. Uh, these do not just happen. They represent a lot of work from a lot of people over a lot of time. We are delighted to welcome Reverend Professor John Swinton, who serves as Professor in Practical Theology and Pastoral Care, as well as Chair in Divinity and Religious Studies at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. For more than a decade, Reverend Professor Swinton worked as a registered mental health nurse. He also worked for a number of years as a hospital and community mental health chaplain alongside people with severe mental health challenges who were moving from the hospital into the community. In 2004, he founded the University of Aberdeen's Center for Spirituality, Health, and Disability. Reverend Professor Swinton has published widely within the area of mental health, dementia, disability theology, spirituality and health care, end of life care, qualitative research, and pastoral care. He is the author and editor of no less than 16 books, including Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges. This won the Aldersgate Prize for the Outstanding Interdisciplinary Work Within Theology. He's also the author of Dementia, Living in the Memories of God. This volume won the Archbishop of Canterbury's Ramsey Prize for Excellence in Theological Writing. Also on the book table in the narthex is Deliver Us from Evil, a call for Christians to take evil seriously, the Didsbury Lectures uh, some years ago. Reverend Professor Swinton is married with five children, He's also a musician. His first album, Beautiful Songs About Difficult Things, will come out early next year. Following a song led by our chapel worship team, uh, Reverend Professor Swinton will come to deliver the first of three lectures in the Parchman Lectures entitled, Finding Peace with Self and Others, The Challenge of the Western Mind. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so today we have a song called Come Away From Russian Hurry that will be sung to the tune of Come Thou Fount. Now, if you came early, you might have gotten some from the first half that do not have the last line. So if you can, repeat after me real quick. It says, all our longings find attainment. All our longings find attainment. When to self we gladly die. When to self we gladly die. 
Yay. Okay, good, you can please stand and we will see this together. be seated. Good morning. First of all, um, well, first of all, I'll let you get used to my accent. And second of all, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I've been in Texas, and it's actually quite nice to see some sunshine, because back home, we're just heading into winter. So, it's good. Uh, so, thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you for allowing me to share some thoughts and ideas with you. Uh, and thank you all for coming. What I want to do over the next three lectures is to um, present us with a, a theology of mental health. In other words, thinking about how we understand mental health uh, in the light of what we know about God and in light of what we know about human beings. Um, but I want to do it from a slightly different angle. So today we're going to be focusing on theology, mental health, and the nature of the human mind, or rather the nature of the Western mind. Tomorrow we're going to be looking at the way in which a theology 
helps us to understand the ways in which we should respond to the mind, but also to recognize the way that our minds are interconnected with politics and economics and other things. And that mental health is a broad uh, uh, concept. And then the following lecture, well, which is tomorrow, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to be thinking about what it looks like, how the ideas that I give you might look like in practice. So that's the plan. So did you ever, did it ever occur to you that you and I might be members of a pathogenic collective that's responsible for the mental health crisis that we're encountering today? Have you ever considered that a focus on mental health may end up being oppressive rather than healing? Did it ever strike you that our efforts to facilitate resilience and enable mental health may in fact be enabling people to cope with systems, attitudes, values, and practices that are deeply unjust and profoundly damaging for our mental health? Do you ever wonder why it is that people don't experience mental health challenges in the same way across cultures, and why Western culture seems to be the worst place to live in with a condition such as schizophrenia? So as we watch the escalating climate dramas on our television set, revealing devastating damage to our world and its climate, do we ever wonder what the implications of these ecological, this ecological suffering might have for our mental health? So in these lectures, I want to help us to think theologically about questions such as these and to explore the ways in which care for individual minds requires that we pay attention to the relational, the social, and the spiritual location of these minds. So I'll suggest that in order to understand the nature of faithful Christian mental health care, we need to look not only at what is going on within individual minds, not least because, as we'll see, there's no such thing as an individual mind, but also at the whole of creation. It's only when we come to view mental health care in relation to care of the whole of creation that the possibility of healing rather than dangerous palliation, that is, sorry, easing the severity of pain or disease without removing the cause, can become a possibility. Faithful mental health care requires that we learn to look inwards, to look outwards, and to look upwards at precisely the same time. So I want to begin by asking the question, what exactly do we mean when we talk about mental health? Well, in order to achieve this goal of a big picture of mental health, we need to ask precisely what it is that we're talking about. Now, the meaning of the term mental health is complex and at times confused. It can be a helpful term, but sometimes, as we'll see in lecture number two, it can be unhelpful and even dangerous. It's therefore important that we begin by developing a theological model of mental health that can guide us as we move along. So those of us who live in the West are immersed in a highly medicalized social context. So much so that it's almost impossible to think about health without first thinking about medicine. Now, medicine is a powerful source of hope when things go wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. However, many of us think when we think about medicine, and indeed about health, we think in rather thin ways. Medicine is a discipline that we go to when we want to be fixed and mended. When something goes wrong with us in our bodies or our minds, we look to medicine to help us. The tendency then is to think that health is a movement away from something, that pain or distress or suffering. The model of health that emerges is from that way of thinking is health as the absence of illness or suffering. We expect medicine to fix us so that we no longer have illness or suffering. The problem is, if health is defined by the absence of or a movement away from illness, distress and suffering, some people will be destined to live their lives with a designation of unhealthy. Those living with terminal illness or enduring forms of physical and mental ill health find themselves in a situation where they are judged always to be ill. Even when they're well, the assumption is that they are in remission 
always waiting for a time when the condition will return. A focus on health as the absence of ill health draws our focus towards cure rather than care. Now this places a huge mass of expectations on medicine and it also shapes our cultural priorities in terms of health. For example, millions of dollars have gone into the research for a cure for dementia without very much success. Only a fraction of that amount has gone into creatively developing care services and alleviating the burden of carers. Likewise, the amount of money focused on helping people to live well with mental health issues is dwarfed by the amount focused on explaining and curing or searching for a cure for mental health challenges. So the ways in which we choose to explain mental health matters, both conceptually and practically. But when we uh, turn to the Bible, a different picture of health emerges. Now, it's interesting to note that the Bible has no words for health, as we may understand it, within a biomedical context as the absence of illness. The closest term we have is the word shalom. Now, at its uh, simplest, shalom means peace. It is, however, not a peace that is defined simply by the absence of disturbance. It's an all-encompassing peace that is defined by the peaceful presence of God in, through, and with all things. The theologian Nicholas Walterstorff describes shalom in this way. He says, shalom is the human being dwelling in peace in all of his or her relationships with God, with self, with fellows, with nature. It's shalom when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall feed, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the suckling child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Isaiah 11, 6-8. Now, in Ephesians 2, 14 to 22, Paul informs us that Jesus is our peace. Shalom is present in Jesus. Indeed, shalom is Jesus. So central to the concept of shalom is justice, righteousness, holiness, and right relationship with God in Jesus. So shalom does not relate only to the absence of distress, but primarily to the presence of Jesus. This is important and in many ways deeply countercultural. Imagine a scenario where an, uh, an Olympic medalist is standing on the podium brandishing his gold medal or her gold medal. Culturally, he or she seems to be the embodiment of health. Yet, if shalom is our model of health, they could be deeply unhealthy, separated from God, and focused only on the things that edify themselves. They look healthy, but they're not healthy. By the same token, someone could be deeply troubled by hearing voices, seeing things that other people cannot see, bearing the weight of an alienating diagnosis such as schizophrenia, and be healthy insofar as their relationship with God holds them and they're in the midst of their storms and their relationships with others keeps them bound to the body of Christ, even when they are struggling. So shalom as mental health orients, orients us towards the importance of focusing on a person's spirituality, not as an added extra, but as a primary marker of mental health. It also means that those whom the, a biomedical model might uh, name as chronically unwell can in fact find health and recovery, even in the midst of illness. If recovery is defined by people being helped to achieve life goals and to hold on to God in the midst of difficulties. So these kinds of internal and interpersonal dimensions of shalom are very important aspects of mental health. There are, however, wider dimensions to the idea of shalom as mental health. It not only relates to individual welfare, it also reaches out to address those structures which are causative 
of ill health and despair. Within this understanding, mental health is deeply tied in with issues of justice. Justice is central to the concept of shalom. Shalom is present when we have harmony within ourselves, when we harmonize with other people, and when we live in harmony with creation and with God. Importantly, shalom is absent when a society is a collection of individuals all out to make their own way in the world. And of course, there can be, be light in a community only when justice reigns, only when human beings no longer oppress one another. As we shall see as these lectures roll out, the formation of people's mental health challenges often emerges from contexts of deep injustice. So any understanding of faithful mental health care uh, inevitably requires that this aspect of mental health be taken seriously. There can be no shalom without justice, no mental health without fairness. As Walter Storff again puts it, shalom cannot be secured in an unjust situation by managing to get all concerned to feel content with their lot. Even if poor people were happy to be poor, shalom is not present. Even if the racially abused and the gender oppressed, the excluded, the migrant, the stranger were happy with their position in life, shalom would not be present. So justice is not determined by whether or not someone complains about something. It's determined by what is righteous in the eyes of God. So a fundamental aspect of mental health care is raising people's consciousness to injustices that may be affecting the mental health of themselves or the mental health of others, particularly those who are vulnerable in any given situation. So shalom is a way of being in the world that mirrors, mirrors the justice-seeking nature of God. It's how we should be and how we should live as human beings who are loved by God. So God, living well, ill health, community, justice, and absence of oppression. Even at this stage, we can begin to see how different this vision is from the assumptions and practices of Western society, and how much thicker this understanding of mental health is from the ways in which we might normally think about it. But there's more. In Ephesians 2, 14 to 15, Paul says this, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. What Paul is saying is that shalom, irene, peace, is, is Jesus and Jesus is, is shalom. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So Jesus leaves his shalom, that is himself in the spirit, to his disciples. We are called to be a people of peace, a people of shalom, who in the spirit of Jesus strive to take what is broken and restore it to wholeness. This striving clearly involves, involves the healing of individuals and individual minds, but it also involves a struggle for justice and the overcoming of those powers that impact negatively on our mental health. There is, however, a cosmic dimension to the work of Jesus that we must not overlook. In Colossians 1, 19 to 20, Paul tells us, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus' peaceful mission is to reconcile all things to himself. Jesus' reconciling work includes individual minds, of course it does, and communities of minds, but it also includes the place where these minds reside, creation. 
Reconciliation means bringing together aspects of creation that have been fragmented and damaged and drawing them into the pro their proper harmony. When one aspect of creation goes out of harmony, it impacts upon every aspect of creation. So mental health will inevitably be affected by what goes on within creation. Dissonance and damage within creation leads to dissonance and damage within individuals and community. This is one of the reasons why justice is important. It's also why sharing in Jesus' mission, mission of reconcil reconciling all things, which includes caring for the planet, is a vital aspect of faithful mental health care. So in the light of this, we might think of mental health care that takes seriously shalom as its model, as having four interconnected dimensions. Firstly, peace of mind. Here we focus on the needs of individuals, exploring ways in which we can help people to develop a sense of internal harmony that allows them to live well, even in the midst of psychological distress. Secondly, peace between minds. This internal harmony cannot be understood apart from the interconnections of human bodies and minds. Community and culture matter for individual minds. Thirdly, peace with creation. Creation is a space in the universe that God has given God's creatures responsibility for to offer care and tenderness. Creation involves ecological issues, but it also relates to issues around culture, politics, economics, and all of the ways that human beings choose to live out their vocation in the world. Disharmony within creation inevitably brings about disharmony in individuals and communities. And finally, peace with God. Peace, peace with God is the all-encompassing focus and desire. To live peaceably with God is a driving vision that shapes and forms our mental health care practices. So in the remainder of this uh, lecture, we'll focus on points one and two, peace of mind and peace between minds. So understanding the Western mind. Normally when we think about mental health, we think about what goes on within a person's mind. We use our healing skills, counseling, therapy, pharmacology, whatever it is, to adjust people's minds in such a way as to bring them relief and sometimes to bring them cure. There is, of course, nothing wrong with that. Nevertheless, our forms of intervention do tend to reflect our understandings of mind. How we think about the mind matters, not just conceptually, but practically. So it's worth spending some time thinking about what it is, the mind, and why we think it is what it is. So what do we mean when we talk about mind? Well, it's notoriously difficult to say what the mind is or where it's located. I suspect that many of us, when asked where our minds are, will point to our heads. We may think that it relates directly to the inner workings of our brain, or we may assume it to be something separate which emerges from the interaction between brain and experience. Either way, many of us implicitly or explicitly assume it is located somewhere within our craniums. When I say many of us, of course, I refer to those of us who live in the so-called Western world, Western Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Those within this sphere of influence share a particular conception of mind which is rather idiosyncratic when compared to other cultures, including the culture that's revealed in the Bible. The assumed theory of mind that prevails in the West posits the idea that the mind is primarily located within uh, individuals, and specifically within ind individual craniums, within which only personal thoughts should reside. So according to this understanding, mental health and ill health are framed in terms of personal maladies, something goes wrong with your mind, that affect private, insulated bodies that contain distinct, discrete minds. If someone encounters psychological disturbance, 
The focus tends to be on how we may adjust the individual's mind in such a way as to enable them to cope with their personal mental health experiences. So the individualization of the mind is mirrored in the ways in which we are expected to respond to psychological distress. When we become mentally distressed, we turn to specialists in counseling, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and other ways of moving us towards healthy thinking and effective coping in the face of adversity. Professionals utilize uh, therapeutic interventions that change our bodies and our ways of thinking, such as psychopharmacology, electroconvulsive treatment, whatever it may be. All of this intended to help control the worst excesses of our languishing. Governments talk about the importance of improving mental health services for troubled individuals, rarely framing the issue in terms of making alterations to ailing societies or, damage, or damaging uh, economic strategies. Such an understanding of mind as an individual thing that requires individual responses makes sense in societies marked by individualism. Individualism comprom comprises a value system that assumes the primacy of human freedom and autonomy. These values are assumed to be the rights of everyone that are embedded in social, political, economic, and religious arrangement. As free, morally equal people who have no formal responsibility other, to others apart from ensuring that the expression of their freedom and autonomy does not impinge upon the freedom and autonomy of others. Within such a view, the idea that minds are individual entities which can be understood without necessary reference to other minds seems to be pretty obvious. But if we turn to scripture, that obviousness recedes. New Testament scholar Susan Eastman, in her reflections on the Apostle Paul's perspective on personhood, points out that for Paul, human beings are not conceived as monological individuals. Rather, they are seen as inherently dialogical, always in conversation, always in dialogue. We are created to be with others not to be alone, Genesis 2.18. Human beings are interdependent creatures who are intended to live in harmonious, dialogical interrelationships with one another and with God. So human flourishing emerges when we exist in the mode of participation and belonging, she says. This participation and belonging relates to individuals, but it's also manifested, at least ideally, between individuals and wider social bodies such as politi politics and economic systems, religions, and other powers and principalities. In a beautifully poetic term, Eastman informs us that for Paul, it is as if physical bodies were bridges rather than barriers, making human creatures into participatory beings, not autonomous, not isolated, but connected to larger bodies. So in this understanding, we are simultaneously independent. Our identity is not swallowed up by others. We remain ourselves. But we're also interdependent. We do what we do in partnerships of mutuality with others. And we're also dependent, wholly dependent on God for all things at all times. Individuality and corporeality are tied together in non-competitive bonds of love. And this is important. It's not as I flourish that I find my well-being, but as we flourish, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Human flourishing is never a private affair, and neither is health, and neither is well-being. The non-competitive re re relationality is important to note as its dissonance with the way our Western culture runs uh, is apparent. So this deep relationality makes us profoundly vulnerable. We're intended to exist in the mode of belonging. When that is frustrated through negative individual or social experiences, we suffer. The fact that a good deal of our psychological suffering emerges from damage and fragmentation to our natural God-given desire to relate, to participate, and to belong be that when we were children or, 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 when, when we, or the things that we encounter as adults, adds theological poignancy to the significance of Paul's model of persons. 
We become who we are as we relate with one another. It's a strength and it's a vulnerability. The relationality and interconnectivity of our bodies um, uh, resonates very much with that idea of shalom and the way in which we are interconnected as individuals, as, uh, as communities, as creation. But what's interesting when you th uh, listen to what Paul has to say about that, he expands that, expands that understanding of the interrelationality of our body to the interrelationality of our minds. Our minds are also inherently dialogical and as such inevitably vulnerable. I mentioned earlier the Western tendency to assume the uh, individual nature of the mind. Because my mind is my own, what goes on within it is perceived to be my responsibility. When we are told that a, pro when we are told that a problem resides within our own minds, we show little resistance. Likewise, my identity, who I think I am, is assumed to be determined by what goes on in my head and or what other think is going on in my head. It's my responsibility to create and retain my sense of identity and to communicate that effectively to other people. Any changes in identity are assumed to be internal rather than collective problems. It's therefore possible for me to lose my identity if I encounter personality changing conditions such as dementia, schizophrenia, which make my personhood and identity apparently unclear, unstable, or maybe even totally different. However, natural as that way of thinking might be for Western people, uh, such a way of uh, thinking about mind and identity is not universal. The anthropologist Tanya Lerman uh, notes this. She says, different cultures imagine mental life differently, both in what thought can do and how one might draw the boundary between the mind and the world. These culturally different understandings have real social consequences. They affect the way that people imagine what it is to be a self, the way they understand time, the way they understand history, the way they understand spirits and rituals, these ways, uh, the way they experience illness and health. So the way in which you imagine your mind to be will significantly impact the ways in which a person's uh, mental health experiences are framed and responded to. So Lerman notes that different cultures have different ways of understanding the mind. She describes these as local theories of mind. For example, in the South Pacific and Melanesia, the mind is assumed to be opaque. She says that its most striking feature is the insistent refusal to infer what other people are thinking unless they ver verbalize their intentions. The impropriety of inferring privately held intentions is so great that it can be impolite to look directly into another person's eyes. So one of the shocking consequences for Melanesians who become Christians, she says, is that their interior thoughts are given a meaning that was previously absent. And as a result, their attempts to be scrupulously devout always, fa uh, always fail, much to their dismay. So each culture has a theory of mind. Each culture probably assumes that that theory of mind is universal, but it's always a local theory of mind. And the way that we think about the mind in the West is a local theory of mind. Interestingly, Christians uh, don't share in the standard Western account of the mind. They oscillate between the local theory of mind and a, a significant innovation that contradicts the standard account. On the one hand, Christians assume the standard account of mind in much of their lives, the idea that your mind is just inside your head. They don't normally assume that strange voices in their heads are normal, but at exactly the same time, they make room for the possibility that God can put words into their heads. Through our spiritual practices, we learn to discern which thoughts are ours and which are from God. Thoughts and experiences given by God from outside of our minds have practical implications. We believe them, we act in them. 
One hears a word from God in one's mind, then one acts in accordance with what that voice says. Less benign is a tendency by some to equate unusual experiences such as voice hearing in the context of psychosis to demonic forces that can permeate individual minds. We'll come back to that in a, in a later le lecture. Positively and negatively, for Christians, the mind is permeable at the level of the divine, divine and the demonic. It's possible for forces outside of the cranium to permeate and enter the mind and to communicate with people in ways that are transformative of their actions. So this counterculture theory, cultural theory of mind begins to point us in the direction of the kind of theory of mind that was held by the Hebrews and which is revealed in Paul's thinking about the mind and in particular what he says about sharing in the mind of Christ. The New Testament scholar Paula Guder in her reflections on Paul's view of the mind informs us that unlike the individualistic theory of mind that prevails in the West, there's a dynamic corporeality corporality to Paul's understanding of the, of the mind. We don't simply have individual minds, we share in the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 2, 15 to 16, Paul states that the person with the spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord so and to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So before Jesus came, humans didn't understand the ways of God. Now, uh, in Jesus and through the Spirit, we can share in the mind of Christ and understand, understand, that, what, that, that, and understand that which was previously incomprehensible. So at a very fundamental level, our minds have been renewed, Romans 12, 2, and we now share in the mind of Christ. So Gooder observes that in Philippians uh, 2 to 5, we get a slightly different nuance. Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So this passage urges us together to think like Christ. And it's that together that's fundamentally important. This challenges the idea that our minds are private and personal. Sharing in the mind of Christ is not simply a matter of learning things about Jesus. It's learning to think together, to think as a body, to think with the mind of the one who is shalom. So spiritual practices shape our minds in this way, but also, uh, so also do our encounters with others. Our shared minds lead to transformed practice. Our transformed practice leads to shared minds. This can be a virtuous cycle or an abusive one, as the shared mind of Christ can be easily corrupted. When we think together in the right ways, healing and unity emerges. When we think together in the wrong ways, alienation, stigma, and distortion emerge. For example, ascribing sin as a cause of mental health challenges or attributing the demonic to people struggling with psychosis Doubting the salvation of people with dementia because they have forgotten uh, who Jesus is are examples of the way in which our shared minds can damage and construct uh, negatively the minds of others. When we realize that we are responsible for the construction of one another's minds, we begin to realize that proper stewardship, stu proper stewardship of the corporate mind is a vital aspect of faithful mental health care. So in the next lecture, we will look at the way in which uh, blindness to our cultural locatedness can be problematic for mental health ministry. At this point, I want us to focus on the idea of mind blindness. A failure to think creatively together can be a dangerous flaw that leads to uh, dangerous uh, damaging outcomes. So there's three dimensions to the mind that we're thinking about. The mind might be thought of as uh, an intertwining of three minds. The mind within the cranium, the extended mind that reaches out and engages with others, and the mind as it participates with Jesus. 
So in line with Eastman's observations about the dialogical nature of the body, we discover that Christian minds are also shared and dialogical. So Descartes' dictum, I think, therefore I am, which has been so influential in shaping ideas about Western people and the Western mind, comes under serious pressure when we recognize the implications of sharing in the corporate mind of Christ. Gura puts it this way. Paul's theology, and in particular his reference to having the mind of Christ, suggests that there is a corporate strand to the mind that our modern culture often overlooks. Thinking, feeling, and imagining together as the body of Christ, inspired by the Spirit, can shape our minds so that we think and act like Christ, seeing the world as Christ did. So as Christians, we have quite an alternative way of thinking about mind. So in conclusion, to move to the end of what I want to talk to you about in this lecture, we may ask, well, what difference does this way of thinking make to the church's mental health care practices? Well, I think there are at least four things that we want to think about in the light of what we've been talking about. First thing, shalom as mental health helps us to see the full dynamic of what we mean when we talk about mental health care. Care of individuals, care of relationships, and care of creation. We need to pay attention to each aspect if our mental health care is to be faithful. Secondly, shalom as mental health and shalom as mental health care helps us to see that healing is not the same thing as curing. Curing is the elimination of something that is undesirable. Healing uh, it requires finding meaning and remaining in touch with God, even in the midst of uh, our difficulties. This entails the, entails the formation of a particular form of community that can embody, enable, and work towards such connectedness and enable us to find Jesus in the midst of the most difficult storms. Thirdly, recognizing that our minds are shared urges us to care for one another's minds. To realize that our bodies and minds are shared and formed in dialogue and community sensitizes us to the need for gentleness, kindness, patience, the avoidance of careless talk, controlled tongues, recognition of the power of our words. Not acting in such ways uh, damages the minds of our brothers and sisters in Christ. In other words, recognizing the interconnectivity of our bodies and minds leads us to love our neighbors' minds as we would love our own. Fourthly, uh, it means that we can no longer understand mental health challenges in purely individualistic terms. As individuals, we bear within us certain configurations of psychological distress that require care and concern. The healing work of mental health professionals is absolutely crucial. Nevertheless, when we ask the question, what is wrong with you? We need to hold another question in mind. What might be wrong with us? And finally, understanding the porosity of the human mind helps us uh, when we feel that we are in some way losing our minds. When we have a personality changing condition such as dementia, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, it's very easy to feel lost and get the sense that one is not the one who, you, 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 one is not the person that they used to be. Our minds have somehow changed and it's assumed that the person that we, ha we, we were has also changed. If our identity is only within our own minds, we can easily become lost to ourselves and to others. Now, without minimizing the pain of such feelings of lostness, the suggestion that our minds are shared might help us to feel a little less anxious. We may be changing, but we still share in the mind of Christ and can rest assured that when our minds fail us, Jesus will not. And at least ideally, the body of Christ will not abandon us. The efficacy of such belief requires operationalization. In other words, it requires a community that can hold our minds in such a way that when, such a way that when we lose them, in inverted commas, others can help us to find ourselves. 
Others can hold us in the midst of the storm. Sheer minds mean solidarity in the midst of our deepest feelings of losing our minds. It's not just you who is struggling. The body of Christ has mental health challenges. Now we'll return to that uh, idea uh, in more detail in lecture number three. But think about that. The body of Christ has mental health challenges. If you have a mental health challenges, we all have a mental health challenge. So having explored something of uh, shalom and something of peace within and between minds, we need to turn to the second dimension of, of shalom, of peace within creation. And looking at peace within creation is the subject of our next lecture. Thank you, Dr. Swinton, for such a rich introduction to these lectures. Let's thank him one more time. Thank you very much for coming. Before I give our benediction, I just want to remind you that our second lecture is at 4 o'clock this afternoon, right here in the, in the chapel. And tomorrow at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock tomorrow is the third. So we really hope that you will come back. Thank you for coming. Let's pray together. Would you stand with me as we close? Dear Lord, as we go from this place, may we share in the mind of Christ. And may we be formed not only by that mind, but by the compassion of the one who showed kindness and caring to us as we are called to do it for the world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed.